Hello children, welcome to our educational TV program on SBC. My name is uh, Mr. Gopal, I'm from English River Secondary School. The topic I have chosen for you today is measurement. This is the very first topic in any science syllabus. You did it in S1, S4 physics also are going to start it. Therefore, measurement. In S1, you studied uh, the measurement of length, time, mass, volume, temperature. You know the measuring instruments that you use and the units in which they are measured. At S4 level in your IGCSE physics syllabus, they stress upon length and time. Now, these are some of the objectives as laid down in the IGCSE syllabus. You will have to be using and describing your use of rules and measuring cylinders to find length and volume. You will be using clocks and devices, analog and digital, for measuring intervals of time. You will have to be obtaining an average for a small distance and short interval of time. And for the extended candidates, you will have to know how to use a micrometer. Now, in the past, we used to measure. We were using our parts of our body, the, uh, the hand span, the foot uh, lengths, the ropes, or all these, and you will realize these were not uh, accurate. We have modern measuring instruments, tapes, micrometer, ruler, etc. If in a game of pétanque we can uh, we see the importance of accuracy, you cannot undermine accuracy. Therefore, when it comes to science, we do guess in science. It is useful but it is very important to be accurate so that science can progress. Now, all measuring instruments, they have got markings in them, which we call a scale. And the very first thing you have to do before using an instrument is to master the scale. How the scale? What is a scale? Because after one is not always two or point one. I'll show you one scale. Now, all these scales have got successive numbers and they have got spaces. For example, in the one which is shown on your screen, between two and three, there are 10 spaces. Therefore, you have to know what is the value of each space. Three minus two is one, one divided by 10 is decimal one. Therefore, each small space is 0.1. I have here part of a thermometer with uh, two different scales, of course, with two different units. And I would like you to read the value which is being shown by the red arrow. I want you, to, there are two different scales, one on the left, one on the right, is part of a thermometer. What value is being shown on the left? And what value is being shown on the right? Study it. Okay, the left scale is reading 21, and the right scale is 70. Can you see? Between, on the left scale, between 30 and 20, you have got 10, and 10 is divided into 10 is equal parts, therefore each equal part is just 1, therefore it becomes 21. Whereas on the left, on the right, sorry, between 60 and 80, it's 20, and 20 is divided into 10, therefore each is small division is 2, and uh, therefore you go up by 2, you reach 70. And remember, you cannot just say, what is the temperature today? You cannot just say 20, 25, you have to put a unit. In this case, the left-hand scale should be in degrees Celsius, and the right-hand scale should be in degrees Fahrenheit. Look at this jug. Again, try to tell me what is the value shown by the arrow. Study it. What is the value shown by the arrow? Uh, 
Clap for yourself if you got 65. Because here, between uh, 75 and 50 is 25, and it's divided into five equal parts. Therefore, each part is five. Therefore, it becomes 55, 60, and 65. When you are to measure something, you have to know which measuring instrument you are going to use. Let us say I tell you to measure the, the length of a football field. If you tell me you are going to use a ruler, it's going to be completely wrong. Okay? So, when it comes to short distances, you will be using a ruler. Let us say you want to measure the width or the length of your copybook, definitely you will be using a ruler. But when it comes to long distances, long lengths, for example, the size of your classroom, a ruler will not be appropriate. Then you'll use a measuring tape. When it comes to very small distances, here, for example, in engineering, they have to be very accurate. The thickness of a rupee, the, the diameter of a wire, you will have to be using a micrometer. While using your measuring instrument, there are certain errors that are to be avoided. And there are three main errors that are to be avoided. They are the parallax error, the zero error, and the end error. Parallax error, you cannot just have a thermometer on the table and just reading it or putting it up and read. It has, the reading should be level with your eye. Your eye should be perpendicular to the reading. Because if you move your eye on either side, you will see a shifting in the reading, plus or minus. It's not going to be accurate. So your eye should be perpendicular to the measurement, to the marking. And uh, not doing this is an example of parallax error. It has to be avoided. Another error we at times do you start using your measuring instrument without checking whether before using if it is on zero or not. If it is not reading zero without measuring anything, you have to re-zero it. If you, if you cannot re-zero it, it is a problem with the equipment itself, you can still use it, but then in the end you have to remove the error from your end measurement. And also, Certain measuring instruments, they are damaged at the very beginning or at the very end. And therefore, you cannot use. But still, you can be using it. But then, if you, since you will not be starting on zero, then you will minus your error from the end result. So, you use this formula. For a true reading, you take your observed reading, what you are reading, and you minus the error, which is a logic and then you will get your true reading. This is important. Now, the micrometer screw gauge, I have one here. Okay? And this is used to measure very short, very small distances. It has got two scales, the thimble and the slave scale. This is an expanded view of the micrometer. What you have to focus on in the sleeve scale, the main scale on the sleeve, the scale on the rotating thimble, and there is also something at the end which we call the racket. When you are tightening something, which you put here, between the anvil and the spindle, then in order to prevent over-tightening of the thing to squeeze or whatever, you use a racket. This racket, when it touches your object that you are measuring, it will slip and clicks. You will feel it so that you are not going to squeeze your material further. So this is the importance of the racket for tightening. It slips and clicks when it just touches the object you are measuring. At school, your teacher will give you the opportunity to manipulate a micrometer. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you have got two scales, one on the sleeve, one on the thimble. What do you do with the scale? On the sleeve, you can read seven. 
And remember here, it is very small distances, it's seven millimeter. On the symbol, you can read 12. It's not 12, it's decimal 12, 0.12. You add 0.12 to 7, and therefore the reading is 7.12. The accuracy is coming on the thimble scale. Therefore, the things, the object you are measuring, is 7.12 millimeter. Now, I haven't uh, looked at this one and tried it. Tell me what is the reading on this micrometer. Look at the slave reading, where you can go. You have got five, and after five you can read six. Okay? And you can see 6.5. This is what you can read on the sleeve. And on the other side, the thimble, you can read 0.13, which you will add, and you get the answer with B. B meaning 6.63. 6.5 plus decimal 1, 3, gives you 6.63. I hope you got this one, but it will come through practice anyway. Now, finish with length, let us move on with time. You know, all know, time can be measured in seconds, in minutes, in hours, in days, weeks, months, years, fortnight, whatever. But we'll be focused on seconds, minutes, and hours. Now, here we will be dealing with a pendulum. Maybe you have you don't know this type of pendulum the pendulum clock that existed in the 70s 80s your grandparent or your parents should be knowing it the discovery of the pendulum came with uh, i mean galileo discovered the pendulum law and christian eugen several years later used the pendulum law to invent the pendulum clock now how did uh, Galileo discover the pendulum law? According to his student, Viviani, he says that Galileo observed a chandelier in a cathedral that was swinging. And from what I have read, he used his pulse to determine the period of one complete swing, which we call the period. He used his pulse to calculate the period of a pendulum. If you don't know what is a chandelier, this it is. It swings. And now let us come to the pendulum. I will show you a pendulum. A pendulum is made up of a length of a string and a weight, which we call a bob. You've got a bob and the length of the strings. This is a pendulum, and you can cause it to swing. Right. Now, there are three variables here in the pendulum. Tell me what are the three variables. There are three things we can vary in this pendulum. What are the three things that we can vary? Right. You can vary the length of the string. You can get it shorter. You can get it longer. So the length of the string can be varied. You can vary the size of the swing. You take it to a small angle, and then you release. Or you take it to a larger angle, and then you release. And the third thing you can vary is the size of the bob. Here I have got a big one. I've also got a smaller one here. So, length of a string, size of swing, and the size of the bob. Now, we are going to experiment on which of the three variables determines the time it takes for one complete swing. Let us look at this one. I will, now, since I'm experimenting of the size of the swing, I will have to keep the length of the string 
and the size of the bob constant. Let us see. Eh? Okay, I, I pull it to this position and I release. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, you have seen at what speed I'm counting. Now, again, one, two, three, four, five. It's almost I'm counting at the same pace. Now, I diminish the length of the string. One, two, three, four, five. Diminish it further. One, two, three, four, five. So what you noticed is that the size of the swing did not affect the time it takes for one complete swing because I was counting at the same pace. It's going to be the same for the size of the bob, it doesn't affect the time it takes for one complete swing, but the length of the string does. The longer the string, the more time it takes. The shorter the string, the lesser time it takes. Therefore, I was counting faster when the length of the string was small. This is an experiment which you are going to perform at school. So remember, when you are, taking, when you are experimenting with the size of the swing, the length of the string, the two other variables should be kept constant. When you are dealing with the size of the bob, again, the length of the string must be kept constant. You may not worry with the size of the string because it doesn't, act, it doesn't uh, affect as such, but ideally you should, and you should not be using too large a size of the swing also. But five to 10 degrees displacement from the vertical is enough. And again, when you are de dealing with the length of the string, the size of the bob should be kept constant. Now, since the time here is very small, you cannot just time one swing. You will not get an accurate answer. And this is why in the table you have seen, I have put time for 20 swings, and then you divide it by 20 to get the time for one swing. This is to improve accuracy. So for accuracy, you take several readings and then you use an average. And how to calculate average? You take all the readings, you add them up, and then you divide by the total number of readings. You get your average. This helps in accuracy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the time for one complete oscillation is the period of the oscillation. And I forgot to tell you, one complete swing is to and fro. For example, this is one swing. It's not two. It's not one, two, three, four. Wrong. It's one, two, three. It is a to and fro movement, which is a complete swing. Now we move on with a stopwatch. The stopwatch, we use it to measure very small intervals of time. And you have got two types of stopwatches. We've got the analog and the digital. The digital is more accurate. It gives you uh, an accuracy of 0 0.01 second, whereas an analog uh, stopwatch will give you an accuracy of 0.1 second. Now, he studies this problem. A boy uses a watch and a second hand to time a ball rolling down slow. It takes three readings. He takes three readings, 12 seconds, 12 seconds, and 13 seconds. And then he found an average. By adding them together, he got 37. He divided it by three, and he got 12.3333 seconds. This is what you get when you use a calculator. And he gives this as an answer. My question to you, is this a sensible answer? The, an the answer is no. It is not sensible because we cannot have an accuracy of 0.3333 seconds. So you can, in an examination, you don't write all the figures that are coming. 
at least for in the case of time, you just put 12.3 seconds. And that would have been enough. If you put all the decimal points, you, you will get your answer wrong. Now, this is over with measurement of length of time. I will invite you now to reinforce yourself for some self-test and check if you can answer these questions. You study this. Remember when you are measuring volume in a measuring cylinder, the liquid in the vessel is curved, and you take your measurement at the base of the curved surface, which we call meniscus. You study the scale here, and the answer, if you got 47, you are correct. So the answer is A. Here, you don't have a micrometer. You, are, you want to measure the uh, the, uh, the thickness of a coin. So you have used a stack of 12 coins. And you can measure the length of 12 coins, the height of 12 coins, which is 2.4 centimeters. So what is the thickness of one coin? I hope you did an average here, and you get the answer as 2 millimeters which is a correct answer, which is B. A last question. Look at this one. You are using a stopwatch to time a race. You can see the start and the end of the stopwatch. So how long did the race take? The answer is B, 46, because you had an, an error here. You can see at the start, the needle was not on zero. It was on 0.5. And so you cannot have 46.5. Uh, it is 46. You have to minus the error from it. So I will leave you here for today. And uh, contact your teacher, read your books. Look at the end of chapter question, try to answer them, and do some self-learning, and stay safe at home. Goodbye.